Hi, I want to show you the game between Anatoly Karpov and Nigel Short. This game is from their match in Linares, which took place in 1992. For those of you that are too young or, or that don't know a lot about test history, Nigel Short was a former um, world championship candidate from England. And uh, he made history being... I think the first British Grand Master since, uh, oh boy, don't get, let me get my facts straight here. Uh, I want to say he was the first British Grand Master to challenge for the World Championship when he challenged Gary Kasparov in 1993. Um, now, this match was important because Karpov at this time was still uh, basically ranked number two behind Kasparov in the world for the longest time. It was Kasparov 1, Karpov 1A. And these two guys had went back and forth contesting the uh, world championship title since 1984. So you had the 84-85 match. Then you had the 1985 rematch. Then you had a match in 86, 87, and then 1990. So it was constantly... The two K's, Karpov, Kasparov, Karpov, Kasparov. And in this candidates match, Nigel Short finally broke that streak by defeating Anatoly Karpov in, in that match. So it was a historic event and um, it opened the door for Nigel Short to challenge Gary Kasparov. So this first game is, this is the first game of the match. And um, it's very inter interesting to me due to Nigel Short's choice of opening here. So Karpov is white. Nigel Short has the black pieces. So D4, Knight of 6, C4. And Nigel Short at this time was uh, known for playing Queen's Gambit Decline throughout his career. Different variations of the Queen's Gambit Decline like the Tartakova variation and also he would play Nimzo Indian um, but here he had a surprise up his sleeve for Karpov and played the interesting E5 which is known as the Budapest Gambit right but nowadays it's probably more or less the Budapest defense but back in the olden days it used to be known as the Budapest counter gambit as black is sacrificing the e um e pawn uh for uh lead and development and some attacking chances now this opening uh is really uh an idea is an example of an idea that developed in you know a certain region of the world and that's why it's called the budapest defense in, in this case it's hungry and uh made its tournament debut Back in 1916, I believe, uh, in Budapest. Um, but of course, that's not the first time it was played. It was played, like if you look in the databases, it was played earlier. But usually, openings would take their name uh, based on, you know, when they actually came into prominence, you know, and, uh, you know, the world really took notice of it. And it usually takes like two strong players before you see that happening. Um, the basic rap against this opening is that that basically skillful handling by by the white player will leave uh, white uh, usually in a better strategic position. And um, black's defensive possibilities, on the other hand, are kind of basically straightforward and and too narrow for grandmasters to really to pick it up. Uh, oh, so it's it's really one of those openings relegated to the lower levels of chess and am amateur levels. Again, it's a great blitz weapon and a short time control weapon. So if you're playing a game 15 or game 30 tournament or uh, game 5 or something like that, it's great to surprise your opponent with. At the E5, it's basically uh, two major continuations so of course d takes e5 is pretty much um 
mandatory <laughs> here. And so this is one of the psychological advantages. So if your opponent is unprepared and tries to avoid the gambit altogether, say for instance d5, right? Then bishop b4 can be played with easy equality or bishop c5, knight c3, and d6. And black has just easy, easy sailing. Or if white declines the gambit by trying to just fortify his d pawn with e3, for instance. Then again, bishop b4 check can be played. Or just simply e takes d4, e takes d4. Then bishop b4 check. And let's say bishop d2 takes takes castle and it's just smooth sailing right there so if white wants anything here he has to uh take up the challenge and basically this is good psychologically for black because if black is well prepared then he has he has um white basically in his in his world so to speak or in his playground so D takes E5, it's played by Anatoly Karpov, and the main line is Knight G4. There is a variation called the uh, the Fajarowicz variation, which starts at with Knight E4, and after Knight F3, Knight C6, A3. D6, Queen C2, attack the, uh, the knight, bishop comes, knight C3, very sharp line, knight takes F2, queen to F5, knight takes H1, and we can see what happens is black is kind of overextended. That's why white is able to give up the rook. White has a lot of space and development. And then he just busts open the black position with e6. After f takes e6, queen takes e6 check. Queen e7. And there's no reason to trade queens here, even though you could. And after queen d5. h6 to prevent bishop g5 after castle g3 g5 and bishop g2 white is just better and that is uh, from the game uh, Samuel Reshevsky versus Art Bisquire grandmaster from 1955 in New York so that's an old line but again you can see by the sharp nature of it that it's good for blitz because you know if you're really not used to playing this is white you can easily you can easily go down and uh make a wrong move here you know in, in this kind of game for instance if you do a natural looking move like queen b3 right say queen b3 get the queen out the way looks natural you're attacking this pawn then knight takes h1 right Queen takes tempo on the knight here. <clears throat> Next thing you know, after bishop d7, let's say you try to get the queen out of there. And now you just all of a sudden, like, hey, what happened? You're just down a rook, wondering, uh, wondering what went, what went, what went wrong. And, you know, say, like, rook b8. So, you could get in a lot of trouble in this opening if you're not prepared. But the main line is knight g4. Bishop f4. Knight c6. Knight f3. Bishop b4 check. Now Karpov opts for this line which was 
uh, I don't know what it's called now, but it used to be known as the Adler variation, where black, where white just basically gives back the pawn, but for a better strategic uh, position, which fits Karpov's style. Karpov has never been a player to really um, get involved in the real, like, tactical complications. So that's what made his matches with Karpov, Kasparov so interesting, is Kasparov was real dynamic and tactical, where... Karpov was always trying to seek for those calm positional waters and just outplay uh, Kasparov. So a player like Alexei Shirov would play into the main line, which is knight c3, with the idea of holding on to this pawn. So after bishop takes c3, b takes c3, queen e7, queen d5, You have these lines with, um, for instance, queen a3 is possible, and then rook c1, which is better for white. For, for example, if he tries to get greedy with that, then just h3, knight h6, followed by g4, and you can see all the space that white has. And white is just better. Instead of queen a3, f6, <clears throat> f6 is often played. And basically turning the game into a true gambit. So after e takes f6, knight takes f6 with tempo, queen d3. And then d6. So what we have in this position, white is up, white is up a pawn. But black has a a nice nice free um, position. It's easy to develop his pieces. This bishop will come out soon. Castle queen side has an open f file. The other rook will come here to the e file. But nevertheless, practice has shown that a pawn is a pawn is a pawn, and that uh, eventually uh, white's pawn advantage usually uh, rules the day. And has the last say in the matter. But again, you can see that, that type of position with the double pawns and being under under pressure from a dynamic player. That's not really Karpov's style here. So this is why he chooses to move knight bd2. He says, hey, you can have the pawn back. I'm just going to outplay you strategically. So queen e7, e3, knight g Takes e5. Knight takes e5. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because notice that this knight is pinned. And if black can move again, he would just play knight takes here. And then say after queen takes, then the castle and rights will be forfeited. Or this pawns, pawns will be damaged. So knight takes. Knight takes. And the humble move, bishop e2. Castle, castle, and d6. So it looks like black has, you know, a decent position. And Nigel Short is, pro is probably pretty happy. Now, <laughs> we're going to see the genius of Karpov here. How he turns this position that looks, you know, okay for black into, you know, into like a, uh, he creates problems here. And the problems all revolve around this dark square bishop right here. Watch the continuation. First, knight b3 is played. So now, notice the bishop doesn't really have anywhere to go. So, Karpov starts playing against this bishop. b6. And Short has decided to put his bishop on this very nice diagonal. A3. So, Karpov makes little strategic, a little, little strategic gains here. What's the gain? Gains the bishop here. So, knight takes c5, right? Gets rid of the dark square bishop. And b takes c5. So, now we see the damaged pawn structure here. Is that enough to win? Of course not. But, it's the accumulation of small advantages that Karpov was absolutely incredible at. 
just for you that excuse me just for you that are interested if d takes c5 can you see why that's a, a blunder first thing is check the pieces check the um for unprotected and pieces that only protected once in this case we see this knight here right only protected by the queen already attacked by the bishop so this is like a fragile relationship excuse me it's a fragile relationship because it's, it's it's hanging by a thread that's how i like to look at it and we see the rook here totally unprotected therefore after queen d5 with the double attack on the rook on a8 and the knight on e5 black would have to resign we just drop drop a piece something has to give All right knight takes f4 e takes f4 and we see the queen gets captured but the queen takes h7 and white is just up in exchange and uh and a pawn and the pawn of c7 is under attack so that's why d takes c7 is not an option here so karpov makes this strategic gain against the bishop here and he damages the uh, black pawn structure so what's next now he plays the move b4 again with the same idea is with this threat of taking here he wants to create a pawn structure that looks like that which is definitely detrimental to the black position so Nigel Short plays knight d7 with the idea now that if b takes c5 then the knight will hop in on c5 nice blockading square bishop g4 excellent move i just wanted to show say that um this is also an option um i think white is slightly better here he has a target now he can double up on the a file um even play um moves like queen c2 here um further uh pushing his initiative on the queen side so short move knight d7 so i already announced to you the basic idea behind b4 which is to create that pawn structure which was is bad for black so at the knight d7 Karpov's next move is kind of easy to uh, figure out it's bishop g4 the idea is just to remove this guy and then go <laughs> continue along again let me ask you a question is f5 possible here right get out of here bishop How, you know is that possible no it is not it's legal but it's a bad move because of the same reason queen d5 check and picking up the rook right here so after bishop g4 Karpov, uh not part Karpov, um short lashes out with a5 and of course he would like he would like uh Karpov to play a move like that which would just basically let him off the hook and that would be followed by the Nimzovic principle of blockade and Karpov will be back at square one looking for an advantage of course he didn't do that he captured get out of there bishop takes d7 bishop takes d7 b takes c5 d takes c5 now you see the slow accumulation of advantages here there's nothing dynamic right there's no big sacrifices it's just pressure and that's Karpov style to the t pressure 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 just one good move after the other queen d5 and i think one thing that kasparov had pointed out about karpov which is interesting is, is karpov plays a lot on his understanding strategical understanding is so great he played a lot on intuition and sometimes he would avoid uh tactics even though um you know the concrete assessment was was um you know was in his favor 
it's he would just always kind of just generally avoid complications and um due to that fact about him he, he a lot of his games he would he would be um susceptible to tactical blows if you look at the, a lot of those games they played i think 121 games in those matches if you look at a lot of those games karpov was better in a lot of those games but then he will f get hit with tactical blows because and i'm not saying he was lazy but maybe just because of his his makeup maybe he didn't have the stamina at the time to calculate everything but he would be better in a lot of positions and make what look like a general move and then get hit with a, a tactical blow here's an example where he probably could have just taken that pawn bishop takes c7 and i think a player like kasparov would have would have taken it bishop c7 then bishop c6 bishop f4 rook a d8 queen e2 and karpov probably wanted to avoid these these type of complications but sometimes you have to you have to be willing to embrace embrace these things so that you can you know go up in material it's a challenging looking position so karpov says you know what i'm not gonna go into that he just played queen d5 just adding more pressure to the position Rook a6 wanted to get the uh, rook involved and Nigel Short knows what's going on here so he basically understands that hey I'm not gonna win in the end game my pawns are busted so I need to go for broke so this rook a6 is designed to get get the rook over to this king side he could have played bishop e6 here though directly attacking the bishop excuse me directly attacking the queen the only thing is the bishop being here don't want to do that the bishop being here on e6 will cut off the you know the the rook coming coming over so he had this idea so he stuck with it but on bishop e6 queen c6 rook fc8 and rook fd1 and we see again black is like in this passive passive state and that's not nigel short style no nigel's a, a active active type player and this is just waiting you know, for the, for the uh, executioner playing playing like that. So Nigel decides to get active. He plays rook a6, queen e5, and he offers <laughs> he offers Nigel short the end game, which is probably brutal. It's gonna you know it's gonna be a brutal. Uh, yeah, I can picture Karpov smiling when he played <laughs> played this move. Like, let's go into the end game, you know. <laughs> so uh, Nigel Short says, "Nope, Rook e6. He sacrifices the pawn. <laughs> Queen takes c7. Rook c8. And notice the uh, Nigel's Nigel's ready to give up everything. Here's another example how Karpov avoided." You know what looks like a natural move, just capturing capturing that pawn. So queen b7. Let's play first. The idea is to keep, at least temporarily, uh, black from playing a move like bishop c6 and amassing forces on the queen side. Because right now, if he play move the bishop, moves the bishop to c6, then the rook on c8 will be captured. So basically, Karpov is recognizes his advantage and is in no rush and is restricting restricting Black as much as he could. So now Queen e8, and now there's some ideas. For instance, like Rook here and Bishop here come again. Actually, Rook here is not possible because of the Bishop here. So moves like Bishop c6 are now realistic. Rook a b1. Nigel goes for broke. He plays h5. And uh, this is basically an unjustified kingside attack. But what are you going to do? You know, he's basically deciding he's going to go out in a blaze of, uh, with, uh, blaze of glory. So, again, bishop c6. 
Could have been played here. That's like a natural looking move. Queen a7. A4. And then f3. Now it's time for prophylaxis here. Prophylaxis. So for instance, if queen takes c5, that move looks suspect on the surface. Just uh, setting up for that discovery like that. Bishop takes g2. And then you have to play moves like that. Which is just unnecessary. And of course, black will be winning. And I'm hoping that most of you can tell that queen takes c5, they will be bad. But this right here, solid, maintains the advantage. And um, that's how you play that. So queen e8, rook a b1, and Nigel played h5. So he's basically hoping and praying that Karpov makes some mistakes and allows himself to become susceptible to a tactical blow. f3. So he's fortifying that diagonal against the bishop c6, rook g6 combination. And remember, I always talk about the ways to deal with uh, bishops. Here's one of the ways, block, blocking the diagonal so that the bishop is biting on granite. Bishop c6, queen b2, h4, of course trying to weaken the the pawn chain, you know, create a situation like that, or you know, like that, where f3 is weak. So what does Karpov do? Just simply plays h3, so he stops that. Now, if e4, h3, and rook fd1, queen e7, that's also possible. But Karpov play a good. H3 is, is perfect. So F5. Again, this is this is desperation time. Queen C2. Attacking the newly created weakness. Queen G6. Queen C3. Attacking A5. And notice how simple uh, Karpov's game is. He just simply... Um, Thwarts Black's ideas and strategy of attacking on the king side, and he just keeps uh, improving his position. So a4 is played. Rook f2, again, for, uh, solidifying his defense because he understands that the king side attack is the only way that Black can possibly win. So he just solidifies his position. Rook d1, and notice. The effectiveness of white's pieces. Queen, the queen is um, dominating the dark squares and the diagonal. The rook on d1, dominating the open file. Queen h5, queen c2. Queen back to g6. King h1, more prophylaxis. Queen f6. Queen b2, want to trade, want to go into the end game? Nope, queen e7, and now rook fd2. So you see black, excuse me, white is just getting ready to trade off. There's g5. Bishop d6, nice move. So black doesn't have time to capture on e3. Queen f7, and bishop takes c5. Capturing and protecting e3. What else but g4? Trying to open up the position. Karpov plays f takes g4. f takes g4. And rook f2. Attacking the queen. Queen h5. Queen e2. Valiant effort by Nigel Short. Notice how the uh, pawn can't really be exchange right now because of the vulnerability of the queen on h5 and also note that this bishop is hanging so you might ask well why did not Nigel Short just capture the bishop right queen captures the bishop goes up a piece he has all this pressure this pressure here 
Well, the reason why is because Nigel King Short, excuse me, Nigel King Short, Nigel Short's King is exposed. And after Queen takes G4 check, King H8, Queen takes H4, King G8. There's several ways to win here. So, one is Queen G4 check, King H8, and then Rook F7, threatening mate. So now the only thing to do is desperation time. Bishop takes G2, Queen takes G2, and Queen C6, pinning the um, the Queen. And now, I don't know. Let's see, what can we do? Say Rook D5. Maybe Rook G6. Queen F3. Just thinking of moves off the off the fly on the fly here. Uh, King G8. Maybe just C5 here. With Rook B8. Yeah, why not H4? And something like that. Rook C7 with this idea. And after Rook F8. Then this. And that should be all she wrote. Basically that the king side attack. Is too much. I probably made it more complicated than it had to be. But. The bishop cannot be captured. So. Nigel saw that he can't capture the bishop, so he played rook g6 instead. Now he's threatening to capture the bishop because he just defended the g4 square. So now what does Karl Paul play? Karl Paul plays rook d6 with the same idea. So if, if queen takes c5, then rook takes g6. So here, Nigel Short opted for Rook E4. And there's several ways that Karpov can win here now, but he decided to play Rook D8. And after King H7, Rook F7, check. Rook G7, Rook takes G7. King takes g7 and then simply queen b2 and Nigel Short resigned. Why did he resign? Because after the queen b2 and say for instance queen e5 then bishop d4. Rook takes d4 and rook takes d4. So I just want to show you this line. That you always got to be on point, even when you're winning. Right after rook takes d4, if e takes d4, then it's a brutal mistake. After queen e1 check, king h2, and g3 mate, ouch. So you always want to be focused, even, <laughs> even when it looks like you got a clear win. You know, that's like a kind of mistake you can make in serious time trouble. You know, maybe your opponent has two minutes on the clock. You might have, you know, 10 seconds and maybe have like a little, whatever, three second delay or five second delay. Your opponent plays that real quick and, you know, you're just thinking, oh, let me, you know, you just, let me keep my pawns together, <laughs> you know. And then it's like, boom, boom, boom. And you're just sitting at the board for half an hour after the game wondering what what went wrong. So you just got to be careful with that. But it didn't get that far because after King, D, after King takes G7. Queen B2, Carl Paul just resigned, and that's um, it's an awesome game in my opinion, um, because it just showed how simple, real simple chess, you know, is effective. You know, there's no big sacrifices or, you know, anything real complicated. It was just like Carl Paul created. Um, let's go back. 
Karpov created this week, this weakness in the beginning of the game. It's this A3 and just winning the bishop here and just turn that. You know, and then after that, that move and just turned it into something, you know, just major, just step, just step by step, sticking with the uh, strategic idea. So with that said, I definitely think that uh, maybe instead of knight, um, maybe instead of knight d7, perhaps, perhaps just capture, but I still think white is better there. So... It's playable for black, but uh, definitely is definitely a, not a cake, not a cakewalk here. So, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little uh, lesson on the Budapest. Actually, it wasn't really a lesson on the Budapest. It just happened to be the Budapest opening, but um, it's really a lesson on uh, you know just small weaknesses, you know, and um, just the importance of just building up a position. And uh, sticking with the plan. So as usual, like and subscribe to my channel. And leave your comments. I would like to hear what everybody out there thinks. Alright, so I'll talk to you later.